apologize, though, for the delay. You're now the jury that's been sworn uh, to hear and consider this case and ultimately decide this case. Um, and before we get started, what I want to do is I want to explain what your role in this case is going to be and what my role in this case is going to be. They are very distinct roles and they do not overlap. Your role in this case is to decide all issues of fact, and you're going to do that by rendering a verdict at the conclusion of the case. So you decide issues of fact. My role in this case is to decide issues of law. These roles do not overlap. You should never think that I prefer one verdict over another, and reaching a verdict is exclusively your job. You already know that this is a criminal case. It's the state of Florida versus Dahlia DiPolito. During jury selection, I alerted you to the charge. It's a solicitation to commit first-degree murder with a firearm. It's going to be your solemn duty and responsibility to determine whether or not the state of Florida has proven each and every element of the charged crime beyond and to the exclusion of any reasonable doubt. Before we go any further, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the trial process, what you can expect over these next few days. In just a moment, the attorneys are going to make an opening statement. An opening statement is what the attorneys believe the evidence is going to show in the case. An opening statement is not evidence. Indeed, what the attorneys say at any time is not evidence. The actual evidence that's going to come into the case can come in or may come in in several different ways. One way that evidence can come in is through witnesses, testimonial evidence. Witnesses will appear here live in court. They're going to take this witness stand to my right. They'll be sworn to tell the truth, and they'll testify here in front of you. That's testimonial witness or evidence. Another way that evidence can come into the case is through exhibits or documents. Exhibits or documents are received in evidence, um, and they'll be marked and kept by the clerk. Now, many times an attorney may place a document or exhibit into evidence, and they do not immediately show it to you. And you're left wondering, well, that's evidence. Don't I get to see the evidence? Rest assured, any exhibit or document that does come into evidence, you will have an opportunity to review. It's going to go back into the jury room with you when you deliberate. So if for some reason you're not immediately shown a document or exhibit that comes into evidence, don't worry, you will see that document or exhibit. However, during the course of the trial, the attorneys may also put an exhibit or document into evidence. They may look at me and they may say, Judge, can we publish that exhibit or document? What that means is that they want you to see that exhibit or document immediately for consideration in connection with the testimony that's being offered in the case. Now, there's a couple of different ways a document or exhibit can be published to you. Uh, one way is it can simply be handed to you. Um, simply, if it's a sheet of paper or document of some sort, it can be handed to you. Each of you will have an opportunity to review it. You simply pass it to your neighbor after everyone's had a chance to look at the document. You put it back on the jury rail. We collect it up and give it back to the clerk. So that's one way that a document uh, can be published. Another way that a document can be published um, is through the use of an overhead projector. We'll set up an overhead projector here in the courtroom. Um, the document will be laid down the overhead, and that's basically just another way to publish a document so everyone can see the document at one time. Um, also, videos that may be played or presented in evidence, they would have to be shown um, through that method. And so that's another way simply to publish exhibits or documents that are received um, into evidence. A few words about evidence before I leave that topic. The lawyers are trained in the rules of evidence and procedure. They owe their clients a legal duty to make objections if they think it's appropriate. If an objection has been made, my typical practice will be to call the attorneys up to the bench. I'll put that annoying white noise on that you heard earlier. I'll discuss the objection with them, and I'll rule on the objection. Now, if I overrule the objection, obviously you're going to either hear that testimony or see that doctrine or exhibit. For example, if there's a question asked of a witness, objections interposed, I overrule it, obviously you're going to hear what that witness has to say. Same applies to an exhibit or a document. If I overrule the objection, you're going to see the exhibit or document. However, if I sustain an objection, you should not speculate about what that evidence might have shown or demonstrated. In other words, if a question is asked of a witness, objections interposed, I sustain the objection, do not speculate about how the witness might have answered the question. Same goes for a document. A document exhibit is offered in evidence, I sustain the objection, do not speculate about what that document might have shown or demonstrate it. We simply move on. Now because the attorneys have a legal duty to make objections during the course of the trial, you should never hold it against an attorney 
or a party from making an objection. That's their job. You should not even hold it against them should I overrule the objection. So regardless of my ruling, if they make an objection, they're doing that, that's because it's their legal duty to do so. Never hold it against a party or an attorney for making an objection. That's their job. Um, after all the evidence has been received, <clears throat> a couple more things are going to happen. Number one, you'll have a closing argument by the attorneys. A closing argument is what the attorneys believe the evidence has shown, or perhaps from their perspective, not shown during the course of the trial. Just like an opening statement, a closing argument is not evidence. It's simply what the attorneys believe the evidence has shown or not shown. It's basically the book end of the opening. At the beginning, they get up and they say, this is what we believe the evidence is going to show. At the conclusion, they get up and say, we believe this is what the evidence has shown or perhaps not shown from their particular perspective. Also, at the end of the case, you will receive your legal instructions from me. That is the law that you must follow in this case. It is my practice to give each of you a hard copy of those instructions. I am required by law to actually read those instructions to you here in open court. But as I read those instructions to you, you will have a copy of them in front of you. Um, you'll have those to go back into the jury room during your deliberations. You will not have to memorize um, the law that you're going to have to apply in this case or guess about that law. I'm going to give you a hard copy of those instructions. Uh, so that's kind of an overview of the trial process going from the opening statement to closing and legal instruction with the evidence obviously in between. A uh, couple rules I want to go over with you. Some of these rules um, you have heard over and over again. Some rules you have not yet heard. Let me start one with one that you've not yet heard and that is um, keep an open mind until you've heard everything. In other words, don't reach any fixed or definite opinions about this case until you've heard all the evidence. You've heard all the argument from the attorneys and you know the law that you have to follow. Certainly we would like you to be thinking about the case as evidence is received, but please do not reach any fixed or definite opinions about the case until you've heard everything. And then obviously when you go back into the jury room and begin deliberating, uh, then it is the time to begin to form fixed opinions about the case as you discuss the evidence collectively amongst yourselves. <clears throat> I know, the rules you're going to get sick of. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make it a little bit shorter today because you've heard them over and over and over again. They're extremely important rules. You cannot communicate with anyone concerning this case, including any communications amongst yourselves, until I send you back into that jury room to deliberate, and at that time only amongst yourselves. Communicate includes any form of verbal communication, any form of written communication, any form of electronic communication, Twitter, tweet, email, post on a blog, post on Facebook. No communication concerning this case. No research with respect to this case. You cannot look up terms in a dictionary, visit the scene of any alleged events in this case. You cannot do any type of research at all. It's extremely important that all jurors hear and consider the same relevant evidence, and that's what's presented here in this courtroom. If you were to do research on your own, the attorneys would have no idea what you were relying upon in reaching your verdict in the case. Um, the trustworthiness of that evidence could not be tested in any way. So it's very important that you decide this case based solely on the evidence that's presented here. I've instructed you over and over again. You cannot listen to or read any news accounts of this trial. Extremely important, um, all three of those instructions. As I've said before, violation of any of those instructions could cause a mistrial, which means we would start the whole process over again. Most of you are here for most of the jury selection process. You know how long this trial has been going on at this time. It would cause us to start the whole case over again. So please comply with all three of those rules if you would. You have no pads in front of you. Uh, you have no pads for one obvious reason. You are permitted to take notes during the course of the trial. You're permitted. You're not required to take notes. Whether you choose to take notes is up to you. If you do take notes, some things you need to know. Number one, please do not allow the note taking to distract you from listening to the evidence. It's extremely important that you listen carefully to the evidence that's being presented here, so do not allow the note taking to be a distraction. Number two, your notes are privileged. No one has the right to review or read your notes. Now, the reason we're asking you to sit in your assigned seats is so that you always get your notepad after every break and when we come back overnight. And as I said last night, it's a pretty simple system. It's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you know the number that you have on your notepad. That's your notepad for this trial. When you come in in the morning or after a lunch break, please make sure 
that you have your notepad. At night, uh, when we take a recess, the deputy is going to collect up those notepads and they are literally locked up overnight. At the conclusion of the trial, your notepads are collected up by the deputy and your notes are immediately destroyed. No one ever reads your notes. You should feel free to place in your notes whatever you wish, secure in the knowledge that no one's going to look at those notes. Now when you go back to deliberate with your fellow jurors, if you want to share something that's in your notes, that's fine. That's you basically waiving that privilege and saying, I remember on day one this witness said and whatever you have in your notes, that's you collectively sharing your memories of the evidence in the case. So you can share whatever you wish that's in your notes with your fellow jurors when you go back to deliberate. The point simply is, absent you waiving that privilege, no one is going to have the right to read your notes. And so, like I said, you should put into your notes whatever you're comfortable putting in there, and rest assured no one is going to take a look at those notes. I believe I went over most of the logistical rules with you last night. I talked to you about what you can and cannot bring into the courtroom. I do recall asking you please remember to wear your juror badges at all times. Remember if you see the attorneys uh, or the parties outside uh, in the hallway at any time, down by the elevators or wherever it may be, they're going to ignore you because they do not want to violate my instructions not to have any contact with you. Um, and so please keep that in mind if you see uh, any of the attorneys or parties outside. As I indicated before, from now on you will be entering and exiting this courtroom through the jury room back through the judicial hallway. So that's how you'll be coming in and out and that should minimize your contact accidental with the attorneys or the parties. I want to repeat an instruction I've given to you before. It's an important instruction but it bears repeating at this time. In every criminal proceeding, a person accused of a crime has an absolute constitutional right to remain silent. And should they choose to exercise that right, you may not infer guilt from that, you may not use that in any manner whatsoever, and it should never concern you about whether an accused person did or did not take the witness stand. I know you've heard that before, but it bears repeating at, that, at this time. Those are the preliminary instructions I have for you at this time. We're going to have the opening statements by the attorneys. The opening statements, as I just said, are what the attorneys believe the evidence is going to show in the case. We do begin with the state. Mr. Williams, are you doing the opening? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to day five. What's great about this case is it is based 100% on Mr. Bolito's words, her actions, and her intent. 100%. And that's what we're going to present to you. So I did, I did a little outline for you guys all along. And as we go through the trial, I'm going to put a little check mark by each one of the exhibits that goes in so you guys can kind of follow along as we go. So I did DD is Valiant DiPolito, MD is Michael DiPolito, that is the husband that she was going to have killed uh, on August 5th, 2009. MS is Muhammad Shahadi. Mr. Shahadi was Ms. DiPolito's friend who she was trying to get him to try to find somebody to murder her husband. And then WJ is Woody Hitman Gene. He's the undercover Boynton Beach police officer, and I call him Hitman. Um, so Real simple, Mr. Miss uh, DiPolito and Mr. DiPolito met in the summer of 2008. So about a year before she's trying to have a bill. She, he ends up buying this house, 1329 Via Del Pepe in Boynton Beach. And all this stuff happens in a short area, the recordings, um, some of the meetings and everything, and, and kind of a close area around Via Del Pepe. It's close to Congress and Gateway in Boynton Beach. And, um, he purchased the house in January of 2009, and she moves in with him. They get married in February of 2009. So six months later, she's trying to have him murdered. And it actually starts before then. Um, but let's go in. So Boynton Beach uh, Police Department first gets involved on July 31st of 2009. That's a Friday. And what happens on that Friday is Mr. Shahade is so concerned about that she's serious about having her husband killed, he can't take it anymore. And he shows up at the Boynton Beach Police Department and he tells the Boynton Beach Police Department that he is concerned that this woman is serious and she's going to have her husband killed. They think he's nuts. He doesn't know her last name. So all kinds of stuff. They, they don't know what's going on. So they talk to him for a while. They decide, you know what, let's record this. 
So the record is saved. And you guys won't get most of the recordings because they're hearsay. Um, but they still don't know if it's real. So this is July 31st. Can we approach? Yes. DiPolito and he tells her that he's going to meet her. And they're meeting about him telling her that he has information about a person that can actually do the killing for her. Um, so he tells her they're going to meet. There's another recording you'll hear at 4.12 p.m. also on Saturday. And he tells Ms. DiPolito that he's 10 minutes away. Then at 4.15, sometime after 4.15, uh, while this is, these phone calls are going on, they're putting a video camera in his car. So they, he drives to a mobile gas station in that same area, and he meets with the defendant. And she gets in his car, and they discuss details. He tells her about who this hitman is, a little bit, very little information. I'm not going to know who he is. I'm not going to give you his name, phone number, stuff like that. We're going to play it for you. Pay close attention to her words. Pay close attention to her words. I'll have to play it for you more than once so you can get all the details. Um, they discuss the money, how much money. She gives Mr. Ma uh, Shahadi $1,200. She counts it out in the zero video and then she hands him $1,200. That's uh, $200. He says it's $200 for him and it's $1,000 for the hitman so he can buy a gun. So the murder says you need to buy a new gun for the murder to be done. Uh, provides a photo of Michael DiPolito and a photo of the house. And she, she points out for Mr. Shahadi where she lives. So pay close attention to all that stuff. So that is on August 1st. August, uh, Mr. Shahadi tells her, let's not talk for a while. The next day is August 2nd, which is Sunday. There's no activity on Sunday. August 3rd is Monday. Uh, 11.38 in the morning, there's a recorded phone call. Mr. Shahadi tells Ms. DiPolito that the hitman is coming up today to meet with you. Uh, she asks Mr. Shahadi to try to be there, so to come with her to meet with the hitman. He says he's going to try to come and meet with, it, with her. 104 in the afternoon, Ms. DiPolito tells Mr. Shahadi that Michael, her husband, Michael DiPolito, will be going to a bank on Wednesday, taking $10,000 out of the bank and giving it to his business partner, and that they can kill him there and rob him of the money and keep the $10,000. You'll hear that phone call. Number six is at 2.47 p.m. This is the first call between Mr. Jean, the hitman, and Ms. DiPolito. He calls her and he tells her, bring $3,000 in cash and a key to your house. And I'll be up in an hour. And I'll call you if I get caught. 
articles and so they talk about where to meet and tell stories to drive on from Miami. Uh, at 3.08 p.m., so shortly after she hangs up the phone call with the hitman, she calls back to Mr. Shahadi and she tells him what the hitman just told her, that he, he wants $3,000 and he wants to key in my house and she complains about the $3,000 that I just gave $1,200 and I can't come up with the $3,000 and I don't want to give him a key to my house because then he could rob me and how do I know my husband's going to get killed and this isn't all just a scam. Pay close attention to her words again. Pay close attention. Um, and then she says, if he won't agree, the hitman, to be paid after, then I want the gun that I paid for and I'm going to go get somebody else to do it. 4.17 p.m. 4, 4, p.m. the same day, so now we're still on Monday. The hitman calls, tells Mr. DiPolito he's 30 minutes away. 5.24 p.m. Ms. DiPolito directs the hitman to the location where to meet. She tells him, I'm going to meet at a CVS in uh, Congress in Gateway. Uh, the, Mr. Shahadi is actually with her. He gets on the phone and he talks to uh, the hitman a little bit. And he described what cars they're going to be driving. I think the hitman was in a red Sebring, and Mr. Chatty told him they were driving in a gold Tahoe. And you'll see the defendant drove a gold Tahoe. He was the passenger in that car. Um, he then says, put her back on the phone. And she gets back on the phone. He says, hey, I know you're with your friend, but when we meet and talk about this, it's me and you. There ain't nobody else going to sit with us. She says, sure, that's good. That's good. But he, Mr. Chatty's there in the parking lot in her car while they get get in the car and talk. So a little before 6 p.m., he arrives at that location. She gets in his car. His car is recorded. So this is his second hit that we're going to see. His car is recorded just like Mr. Shahadis was recorded back on Saturday. Um, she enters his car. They discuss the details of the murder. Um, he, and it's 20-something it's minutes. to him, hey, you could kill him at the bank. He's going to be in the Bank of America down in Fulcrum. He's going to be taking $10,000 out of the hitman. Good. Kill him there, you can have the $10,000 on top of this. Uh, they discuss prices and stuff. He agrees to accept the money after the fact. Um, the police are listening live to all this stuff. So they're, 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 on, uh, they're able to listen. So while the videos are going or the, the telephone calls, they're either sitting next to the person making the phone call or they're listening live as it's going on. Tuesday, Mr. Jean contacts her, the hitman, and he tells her that the banking's not gonna work. It's too risky, it's out public, there's no way that's gonna work, we're gonna have to do it at your house. And she had already described her house, her husband's patterns, the fact that he just had surgery, he can't defend himself, he doesn't have a gun, the alarm situation, what time he walks the dogs in the morning. Um, so he says, all right, so we're gonna do it in the morning, and we're gonna do it Wednesday morning. You have to be out of the house by 6 a.m. When you come back home, he's going to be dead. There's two bullets in his head. It looked like a robbery. I'll break something into the house, break the window, and make it look like he was robbed. August 5th, 2009, the day of the hit, the police surveil her house in the morning. And of course, a little after 5 30 in the morning, guess who leaves? She leaves to go work out at the gym so her husband can get two bullets in the head and be murdered inside her home. All right, thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Claypool, whenever you're ready. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Remember we talked yesterday about actions speak louder than words. Uh, this is a case about a rogue police department, the Boynton Beach Police Department. This department was more dead set on generating an episode of Cops TV he forgot to tell you about that. Cops television show was at the Boynton Beach Police Department wanting to film at the police department. And starting in July, July of 2009, 
the communications director at Boynton Beach Police Department. You'll hear Stephanie Slater, she'll come in and tell you. She circulates an email to the entire police department. Hey, the cops television show is going to be on premise filming. And you're going to hear testimony in this case that the first phone call, remember Mr. Shahadi, the first phone call that he makes to the Boynton Beach Police Department, he says, I don't think it's that serious. There's an issue of domestic abuse. And all I want you to do, Boynton Beach Police Department, is pick up the phone and call Dahlia DiPolito. That's what he wanted them to do. And he also said, you're going to hear from him. We're going to call him in this case. You'll hear his words. He will tell you that he never thought this was serious. He will tell you he never thought that Ms. DiPolito would ever get arrested. Mr. Shahadi will tell you, he'll look you in the eye and tell you that he never wanted to be involved in any investigation. Mr. Shahadi will tell you that he never wanted to be wired. Mr. Shahadi will tell you that he told the police department that he did not want to participate at all. Mr. Shahadi will tell you that this, this confidential informant package that he signed, that the state's going to introduce, he was never explained what it was, didn't really understand what it was, and in fact, he's going to tell you that this police department duped him, that they lied to him, that they told him that you're going to remain confidential, nothing's going to happen, you don't have to be involved, and all you got to do is take a pen and sign here. That's what you're going to hear him talk to you about. So the evidence in this case is going to, is going to show that the conduct, pay attention, like Mr. Williams told you to pay attention to her words, you need to pay attention in this case to the conduct of the Boynton Beach Police Department because that will speak the truth to you in this case. It's the conduct of this police department from day one they, were, they never carried out a credible investigation in this case. This was not an investigation. The evidence will show in this case, this purported investigation had zero, zero integrity, none. And you're going to hear from a witness in this case, Tim Williams, 30 years of experience as a senior detective who handles these types of investigations. And he will tell you point blank this investigation, this alleged investigation should have ended, should have ended the moment that Muhammad Shahadi says to that police department, I don't want to be involved. And you want to know why it should have ended then? I'm going to read to you. Well, rather than read it, you're going to hear in this case what are called directives. Directives are policies and procedures that police departments generate. They're basically rules that a police department has to follow when they carry out an undercover investigation. One of those rules in this case, and it says point blank, I'm, I'm going to read it to you during the case. It says, when an informant says to a police officer at Boynton Beach PD that I do not want to be involved in an investigation, I don't want to be wired, I don't want to participate, the rule says that the Whitney Beach Police Department must, they must remove that informant from the investigation. It should have ended right there. But you want to know what happened? The Boynton Beach PD saw a great opportunity to get on TV. They wanted fame and notoriety. So what they did when Mr. Shawty makes his first phone call, this guy calls up, and it's not a 911 call, it's not an emergency call. You know what you tell him? I come into the police station. Well, you know what Mr. Shahadi says? I don't want to come into the police station. You know what they say to him? You've got to come into the police station. So he goes into the police station. And then you know what the police department tells him then? You must cooperate. And guess what they tell him after that? The good old police department is supposed to protect and serve 
The evidence in this case will show this police department was deceiving and manipulating for their own fame and notoriety. You know what they told them then? You have to participate. Well, guess what? We're going to prosecute you. You're going to hear Shahadi walk into this courtroom, and he'll tell you the following words, three words. I was scared. Okay? He was frightened that he would be arrested and prosecuted by this rogue police department if he didn't go along with the program. All right, let's talk about when Shahadi then shows up at the police station on July 31st, like Mr. Uh, Williams told me. He then shows up at the police station. And guess what these officers do? Remember, they, they want to stop a murder. You heard the talk, talk about this. Oh, the evidence is going to show. Listen to Dipolio's murder. She's going to murder this guy. Guess what? Shahadi shows up. The police officers break the rules again. It's required that they audio tape the interview between the informant. He wasn't even an informant yet. Shahadi calls. He comes in. They're supposed to interview him and record it. Well, guess what? Guess what they do? They talk to Shahadi for over two hours, right? Y'all might be wondering, are you going to hear that interview? Guess what? No, you won't. You're not going to hear that interview because the Boynton Beach Police Department didn't bother to record those first two to three hours that they met with Mr. Shahadi. And, and the evidence will show that the reason why they didn't interview that is because, one, they were laughing about it, there's evidence in this case that these officers were laughing when Mr. Shahadi was describing what was going on. Does this sound like a police department that is worried about Ms. DiPolito taking a, having a gun put to Mike DiPolito's head? Doesn't sound like it to me, and the evidence is going to show that. They weren't worried about Mike DiPolito being worried. They were laughing. And the reason why they didn't record that first two to three hour conversation is because they wanted to script a good TV show for cops. They knew cops was filming. So they said, holy mackerel, we're striking gold. We got it. We want, this is great, right? This is going to be great. They manufactured more than what was there. That's what this case is about. So then after that two to three inter hour interview where they didn't record, they then recorded the conversation with Mr. Shahab. And then they give him this confidential informant packet. They give him about three to five minutes, a thick packet. Hey, sign, sign. And then guess what? The same day, they then said, we want you to call Dahlia DiPolito. And by the way, I'm saying Dahlia DiPolito, but guess what the evidence is going to show? This police department didn't even know her last name. They didn't even know her last name. Yet they were, they were hey, Muhammad, give her a call. Let's try to set up a, let's set up a meeting. You're going to hear evidence in this case from Tim Williams and even their own folks. The Boynton Beach PD's own police officers, both current and former, are going to tell you. They're going to tell you that conversations should have been recorded. They should have been recorded. And they could have been recorded and they weren't, and that we don't have those conversations. And by virtue of not having those conversations before us, it deeply compromises the integrity of the investigation. You have to have integrity in a police department investigation. Whether you like somebody or not, whether you think they said something bad or not, you can't break the rules and then be rewarded by breaking the rules. And that's really what this case is about. And then what happens? Getting back to July 31st now. They tell Shahadi, go, go, call her, set something up. Well, there's going to be testimony in this case and evidence that on August 31st and then or July 31st and August 1st, I'm going to tell you. August 1st alone, now that's the day that this boy from each PD was accelerating things and wanting Shahadi to go meet with Dali and Dibalita and the gas station. Guess what? 186 phone calls. 186 phone calls made by Muhammad Shahadi to Dali and Dibalita in one day, leading up to him meeting her 
at the mobile gas, at the mobile gas station. Now, what does that tell you? The evidence in this case is going to tell you that if you think that Dahlia DiPolito was dead set on killing her husband, then why does Muhammad Shahadi got to be calling her 186 times to get her to meet him? That's common sense. You know that. You, you, and, and ask yourself this. Ask yourself this. The rules of the Long Beach Police Department require all of those phone calls to be recorded. They're, they're supposed to be recorded because it preserves integrity. It creates credibility within a police investigation. And what it does is it eliminates any speculation about what was said or what wasn't said. And we have none of those audio recordings, not zero. That's an abuse of power. The evidence in this case is going to show that is an absolute categorical abuse of power by officers at the Boynton Beach Police so then we have the, then, then we move to the meeting at the mobile gas station. What's interesting about that is after that meeting, remember Mr. Williams said there was a little bit of a delay? Remember that meeting at the mobile gas station? That takes place on August 1st. The next tape you'll see was how he did believe it. And this undercover hit guy was August 3rd. Okay? Two days. Now the evidence in this case is going to show that if the Boynton Beach Police Department really, truly believed that Dahlia DiPolito intended for killing her husband, do you think they're going to wait two days to go set up another meeting over at CVS Pharmacy? You would think so? Well, the testimony you're going to hear in this case is that if a police department really believes that somebody's going to kill somebody, they're going to do something immediately, immediately to prevent that. Well, guess what? As of August 3rd, when there's this meeting at CVS, they still don't know Dahlia's last name. They don't even know where Mike DiPolito lives. They've done very little background investigation on Muhammad Shahadi. And what they do on, on, on August 3rd is they have this meeting, and nobody from the Boynton Beach Police Department calls Mike DiPolito. That's the evidence will show you. They didn't pick the phone up. Hey, Mike, we, we think your wife is going to be here. You better be. Mike, look out. Get some security. Provide him security. Do surveillance on Dahlia DiPolito. No surveillance was done at all on Dahlia DiPolito. Are you kidding me? Huh. Really? Does that, does that sound to you like a police department that really, really believes that Dahlia Dipolito is going to kill her husband. Now, I've only told you about 186 phone calls on August 2nd, 2009. 135 phone calls from Muhammad Shahadi to Dali Dipolito. And guess what, folks? In this case, again, the rules are broken by the point of view. We don't have access to those 135 because they didn't bother to record any of those phone conversations. And you're smart enough to know why they didn't record that conversation, any of those conversations. On August 3rd, 2009, 105 phone calls that Shahadi's making to Dalia. You don't think that's pressure? The evidence in this case is going to show that that multitude of phone calls, unrecorded by an individual who's feeling threatened to be prosecuted by the police department that's interested in fame and fortune on the Cops TV show, that that proves that she was feeling pressured. And why was she feeling pressured to move forward with this? Because the undercover, the informant of Muhammad Shahadi had been told by the Boynton Beach Police Department, dude, we're coming after you unless you get the job done. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Shahadi on the stand. He will tell you that he was calling Detective Marino and saying, hey Marino, will you stop calling me? Yeah, Shahadi will sit there. He'll tell all of you that he was getting tired of Detective Marino 
harassing him. Ten times a day, Muhammad, did you get her? Muhammad, have you called her? Muhammad, have you set up the meeting? And remember Tim Williams I told you about, the 30-year veteran for the Los Angeles Police Department? He's going to come in here and tell you. You know what he's going to tell you? That, that, that he's never, ever, ever in his career seen an investigation, an undercover investigation involving an attempt to kill somebody that takes place in the span of three days, three or four days. He will tell you that is unprecedented, that you can't accelerate things that quickly. By accelerating, you, you break rules and you compromise. In this case, the evidence in this case will show that you can't reward a police, officer, police department for bad behavior. Now let's talk a little bit more about uh, this, this gentleman called Sergeant Cherry. Okay? So you have, remember, you have the CBS meeting on August 3rd. But, but before there was this meeting between Dahlia DiPolito and this gentleman, Lady Jean, that you'll hear from, there was an encounter just before Dahlia goes and meets Witty Jean. Remember, Witty Jean is the undercover police officer now. Muhammad Shahadi was the gentleman who called in. He's what's called a confidential informant. So before Dahlia goes and meets Witty Jean at the CBS, they have an encounter at a Chili's restaurant. And guess who set up the encounter? It wasn't Dalia DiPolito. It was Muhammad Shahai. So ask yourself this question during the case. Why is it? Why is it, if, if Mr. Williams is telling the truth that he can prove this, why is it that if Dalia DiPolito is so determined to have her husband killed and she's so dead set on it, why does Shahai have to now meet her at Chilkey's? before she ever goes and meets Witty Jean. Big question. Well, the evidence in this case is going to show that the reason Shahadi had to have this meeting at Chili's is because both he and Detective Marino knew that they were losing Dahlia DiPolito. We're going to have Marino in here. I'm going to ask him about that. They knew that they were losing her. She was reluctant to move forward with this. They were worried about cops. Let's talk about cops real quick. I didn't give you the timeline, and I apologize. For months, Stephanie Slater of the Boynton Beach PD, she's emailing, she's sending notes over to cops TV show. Hey, guys, when are you coming over here to film? Right? Months, she's trying to lobby to get them to come. So they commit to coming, right? She sends a blast email to everybody from the Boynton Beach PD. Cops will be here on August 5th. So if anybody, if anybody from Boyd Beach BD comes in here and tries to tell you otherwise, they're lying. Because everybody in that police department knew cops was filming. But, but guess what happens? Moving forward to Sheridan again. Remember Sergeant Sheridan? Sergeant Sheridan was, was the lead guy. Well, he was the lead supervisor in this case. Detective Marino was in the trenches. Sheridan was above. Sheridan goes to the cops TV show folks and says, hey, we're not going to do you covering patrol cars. we got a better story for you. Right? That's what he does. He changes the scheduling for the cops TV show so that they can cover Dahlia Nicolino. Wow. And in fact, the Boynton Beach Police Department circulated footage in this case, about Dolly. Why is that important? The evidence will show that that proves they had a motive. They had a motive to set up Dolly DiPolito and manufacture his alleged crime. They had a clear motive. Fame, notoriety, posting all this information out for the world to see. Still on their website, believe it or not. The evidence will show that. Does that sound like a police department that's really interested in stopping people from killing each other? And guess what else Sheridan does? You're going to hear about it. After they finally take Dolly and Jim to the police station, you know how desperate this guy is? You know how desperate he is for fame? He takes, takes a piece of paper, right? 
He sits in front of Dolly, didn't leave, get the leader now at the police station. Puts in front of her, hey, hey, sign, sign this piece of paper. It's just a waiver of your Miranda rights. You know, the Miranda rights are you have a right to remain silent, right? So, ah, it's just sign right here. It's, it's a, it's, you're, you're just waiving your Miranda rights, right? Okay. Dolly is all upset, signs the document, takes it back. Takes it over to the dude, Mr. Langley, at the uh, Cops TV show. Mr. Langley looks at it and says, wait a minute, you, you told her this was a waiver for the for Miranda rights? He's like, yeah. We well, you know what the cops folks say? Well, well, it's not. It's not a waiver of the Miranda rights, right? He committed fraud. You know what he did? It was... A waiver. This is how desperate this police department is. It was a waiver for her to appear on the cops' TV show. Can you believe that? A sergeant of a police department committing fraud to try to get this on TV. That's how desperate this police department was to manufacture this alleged crime. Now we have almost done. Let me let me backtrack a little bit. Now let's go back to Chili's. Remember we were talking about Chili's. Chili's is important. The evidence is going to show that, again, the reason why Muhammad Shahadi has to set up that meeting is because he's losing Dali Dipoli. He's losing her, and he's worried. At this point in time, this guy's worried. If I can't get her on tape with an undercover cop, I might be going to jail. He'll tell you that. You don't think he's got something, that's at, at something personal at stake in this case? He now has a motive. You have a motive by the police department, right, to manufacture this. You now have a motive, in this case, by Muhammad Shahadi to set up Dalia Dipolito to instigate, to pressure. You tell me over five, you'll hear evidence, over 570 phone calls during a five-day period. I've broken down some of the days for you. But 570 phone calls. And if this was a fair trial with a level playing field from the police department, guess what? You folks would be listening to 575 audio recordings so we can get to the truth, so we can find out whether this Dipolito in fact was reluctant, whether she was worried about this. Maybe she needed to rethink this. Maybe she had issues with her husband that needed to be resolved. But guess what? We won't have those audio tapes because the police department is so reckless Hapless and selfish and self-centered that they intentionally, intentionally made sure that their script for the Cops TV show would go forward at the expense of trashing Dahlia DiPolito's constitutional rights. That's what this case is about. Don't fall for this crap. Now, Chili, just to prove my point, finally I'm going to get you to Chili's. Shahadi will walk in here, his honor will issue an oath to Shahadi. And you know what he's going to say? I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And guess what, folks? I am 100% sure that I was wired when I went into Shilas. 100% sure. He was asked numerous times in deposition. Well, guess what? Wouldn't you all want to hear what happened in that 40 minute encounter in Chile? Right? right before, coincidentally, right before he drives her in the car over to Witty Jean, who's sitting right here. Right? He drives her over there. Why does he drive her over there? He wants to make sure she follows through. He's got to make sure he follows through, she follows through, so he doesn't get in trouble, so he doesn't get prosecuted and goes to jail. Well, we don't have. That audio tape, it doesn't exist. That is a patent violation of the Point Beach Police Department policies and procedures. They're called directives. Okay? Not only do we hear from our expert on this case, Tim Williams, but you're going to hear from Frank Ramsey. Frank Ramsey's a former sergeant, right, from the Point Beach PD. He will tell you that that's flat out inappropriate bad police practices. You have to have audio recording of that chilling encounter. 40 minutes. Here's another thing I forgot to tell you. Boynton Beach Police Department, they're so excited about the cops episode, they, they've got about 13, I can maybe here, 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 
here, here, here, here. They've got about 13 police officers surrounding Chili's, right? <laughs> and how about this? Not one single Point Beach police officer goes inside Chili's. Why do you think that's important? If this police department truly believes that Dow did good for me and wanted to kill them, they would have somebody inside monitoring at least one or two undercover police officers inside that Chili's watching the future. Listen to what's happening. They don't send anybody into that church. That's why. Right. Because they all knew this was all a charade. This was all a sprint. They all knew that this was not serious. So they don't send anybody inside. Now, let's talk about that Mr. Shahadi saying he was walking. Well, you're going to hear testimony from, from uh, possibly from Sergeant Sheridan, but you'll hear from Mr. Bonifair and a couple other folks from the White Beach PD. Guess what they said happened? Right? They're going to try to come in here and tell you that, oh, we think the wire malfunctioned. Can you believe that? This woman's going to kill her husband. And there is a, and I'm going to, you'll hear here in this case, there's a policy and procedure in place at White Beach PD says the following, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot compromise an investigation, you cannot, if there is a malfunction of equipment. You can't. So what does that mean? They broke the rule again. What that means is, and Sergeant Ramsey will be honest with you, we don't know this guy. He's going to tell you, former sergeant, 20 years on the police force, former Water Beach PD sergeant, he will tell you. Point blank. There is no excuse for Muhammad, for if there truly was a malfunction in Chile, there's no excuse for that to not have been correct. Our position in this case, and the others will show, that we believe that Mr. Shahadi was wired and there wasn't a malfunction. Just to make it clear, evidence from our end is going to suggest that he was wired, they had the audio, and for whatever reason, we don't have that audio. Let me tell you why real quick. Let me fast forward a little bit on that. Here's why. Because you're going to hear from the city folks, too. We sent out a request to them. We said, hey, send us all your information on, on repairs of, of video wiring equipment. Send us all your information out for requesting new wiring, right? And guess what we got back? Mm, zero. No record. No record of the Boynton Beach Police Department ordering any new wiring equipment or getting any wiring equipment repaired. What does that tell you? Evidence in this case will tell you that they're lying. They're lying again. They're cheating and they're destroying evidence. That's what we're going to argue. We're going to prove it. And why are they doing that? Because they don't want anybody to know that Miss DiPolito is backing out. Because they don't want anybody to know that because that's going to kill their script. Their once in a lifetime chance to become famous, post everything, get on TV. That will kill it. We gotta make sure that doesn't happen, right? And what's interesting is I will tell you as of today, we don't even know who wired Muhammad Shahadi. We don't even know who, who from the police department wired him, where, what happened to the wiring. I haven't heard a peep yet. I'm, I'm hoping that the state's gonna talk about that. Do we know what did it really malfunction? What's the evidence of that? Is there any evidence of that? We argue no. There's zero evidence in this case of a malfunction. And that means that this police department allowed a man who, who had, had a checkered history in the past, without going into detail, go into a restaurant with somebody who's supposed to kill her husband 10 minutes before she goes and meets the undercover cop. And we have no clue in this case what those two discussed. But I'm going to tell you that the evidence in this case will show that at that point in time, Dalia de Bolito was reluctant to do this, and, and, and Muhammad Shahadi was putting pressure on her. And what more evidence do you need in this case than the 576 phone calls? You all are smart enough. You know that if this woman wanted to knock her husband off, and she, she's so sure she's going to do it, you know how many phone calls it would take from Shahadi to de Bolito? One. One phone call. But it took 576 phone calls to get this script done 
for the cops TV show. So at the end of the day, we're going to be asking, find us the Toledo, not guilty. And the reason why we're going to be asking you to find her not guilty is because the conduct, the egregious misconduct, the blatant violations of the law and policies and procedures within the police department. The, the categorical, categorical and, and massive failure to preserve evidence that we need in this case to get to the truth. And by the way, they control the evidence. You all know, we talked about this in Jerusalem. The evidence will show that the police department, they, they hold the upper hand in investigations. They control everything. You think that's a fair, fair claim? No. We didn't hear about it. In this case, you're not going to have to argument. The evidence will show that it's not. This was not fair. They controlled all the mechanics to preserve an investigation filled with integrity to carry out their honorable job. And the evidence in this case will show that they completely trashed, they completely mocked law enforcement in this entire country. A mockery of our law enforcement system by putting their own self-interest above Ms. Hippolyta, violating her constitutional rights through egregious misconduct of this police department. And at the end of the day, what we're going to ask you to do is find Ms. Hippolyta not guilty because look no further. Look no further. Actions speak louder than words. Remember that throughout this case. Look at the videos all you want. But look at the litany. Connect the dots. Remember? Connect those dots from that first phone call from Shahadi all the way up to the pressure, intimidation, prosecution, 576 phone calls, no audio recordings, no audio recordings of Chili's, Sergeant Sheridan committing fraud. Connect all those dots and you're going to find at the end of this case that it's the misconduct of this police department that will prove to you that this woman over here, Ms. Dahlia Hippolyta, never intended on killing her husband. Thank you very much for your time this morning. I look forward to speaking to you again at the end of the case. Thank you, Mr. Claypool. Thank you, Your Honor. State ready to call its first witness. You want to talk? Okay. Counsel, can you approach for just one quick second? Thank you.